Now today we in a very interesting place in the Bible, or I would say a very difficult moment in the Bible, particularly if you are Jewish or if you are from the nation of Israel, they don't like to be reminded of this part of Jewish history because it was a difficult moment for them. In fact, it was a disobedient moment for them and the Lord was not pleased with them. So that's my cheery thought for today as we look at Hebrews chapter 3 and verses 7 to 19. But we need to look at it. We believe in expository preaching. That means as we preach through the Bible, when, it comes, when we come to a difficult part in the Bible, we don't want to skip over that part because that would not include everything God has inspired for us. You get this, obviously, and we're all tempted, myself too, I was really tempted to skip over this part in the Bible, but <laughs> that is not God honoring. He's inspired his whole word, and his word was written down for his church, and we need to consider every part of the word of God. Now, a good message often starts with an illustration. You'll find that. A good preacher will often start with an illustration. Now, that is why the writer to the Hebrews, he was probably a very good preacher. Uh, and in fact, this letter is a, in a very effective uh, uh, message. That is why he started his message here in Hebrews 3 verse 7 with an illustration from Israel's history. And it goes right back to the time of Moses when the Egyptians, when, sorry, when the Israelites left Egypt, crossed the Red Sea and went to Mount Sinai and eventually came to the point where they were going to cross the Jordan River into the Promised Land. And at that moment, a horrible thing happened. So let's read together in our Bibles from Hebrews chapter 7. Now the writer to the Hebrews, obviously, Hebrews was uh, written to a congregation, a group of Christians, Jewish Christians mostly, that lived in Jerusalem a long, long time after the exodus from Egypt. Probably, I don't know, 1,500 years, even more, even longer, a very long time elapsed. But he's addressing these Jewish believers now who trusted in Jesus Christ for their salvation. And because of persecution, these people were tempted to go back to the old ways of Judaism. And you must understand this, that in Jerusalem, the temple, Herod's temple was still standing. A very imposing structure. Herod was around and, and the old Jewish faith seemed so solid and visible and, 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 and all the things that went with it, all the sacrifices. And so people could see those things daily and these Jewish Christians were converted from that situation. And because of persecution, probably Roman persecution, but also persecution from their own families and so on, they were tempted to give up on this Christian trip that only involved suffering for them at that time as they saw it. And this is the writer to the Hebrews' word to those people and also to us today. He says, Hebrews 3 and verse 7, listen to God's word. So as the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion during the time of testing in the desert where your fathers tested and tried me, says that's the Lord, and for 40 years saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. And I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And now verse 12. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. 
And the living God, I remind you, is this God that we've been speaking about from Hebrews chapter 1. God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God's final revelation, the one who is greater than the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles, the one who, who, who sustains all things, the sovereign Lord, the one who is far greater and far more glorious than the angels, the one who is greater than Moses, the glorious one, the Lord Jesus Christ. The writer says, See to it, brothers, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another. It's got the local church in mind here. Christians together in mind here. Daily. As long as it is called today. So that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ. If we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As just being said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Were they not all those Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was God angry, he, God angry, for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the desert? And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. Now let's just pray together. While I pray, I'm going to ask Andrew and Carol just to switch around. And I want to show you a little map of the ancient Middle East. Lord, we thank you for your word this morning. And as we can see clearly, just from the words we've read, that this is a serious, serious chapter. And we need to be careful in how we look at your word and also, Lord, how we live our lives as your people. I pray, Lord, that this would not be a, a discouragement to anyone here this morning, but that we would see the wisdom in you, of you including this, these verses in your words so that we would be careful to honor you and to love you with all our hearts and minds and souls. Please, dear Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Are you there, Carol? Good. My wife's very really quick. She's amazing. Far better than me. Now, can you show us this map? Now, oh, I don't know if we can see what's going on here. It looked so far brighter at home on the TV screen at home. But, nevertheless, I'm sure you can see that this is a map. And on the left side of the map, we have Egypt. Egypt and in the middle there is what probably what we would call today Saudi Arabia. And if you look there in the right hand corner, you'll see the name Jerusalem. And yes, Jerusalem is on that side. So what happened during the Exodus is what we have here. The land of Goshen on the top left hand corner. Can you see? The land of Goshen. It was a very fertile part in Egypt. The Egyptian of the, the, the Israelites left there and they crossed the Red Sea somewhere in that area uh, by faith. Remember, they got to the Red Sea and they were hemmed in by Pharaoh and his army. Uh, Pharaoh was pursuing them and they were in a really uh, tough spot. So the Lord opened the waters of the Red Sea for them. And they went through the Red Sea to the other side. And the Bible tells us they did that by faith. Maybe just show the next slide for a moment. Or that maybe give us a clearer picture of where they crossed the Red Sea. Do you see that red line there? Um, this other map is a bit inaccurate in that area. But there you can see they crossed the Red Sea over there. And that red line goes down. Let's go back please, Carol. 
Then they trekked down and at various points they tested the Lord and they complained and the Lord provided for them manna and quail and water and stuff. And then eventually they got to Mount Sinai. And you remember what happened at Mount Sinai? Anyone? Ten commandments were given. Oh, all the commandments of God. Moses went up the mountain and you receive uh, stone tablets written with the finger of God uh, on top of that mountain. And as he came down, what did he find? Because he was up there for a long time. What did the people do? I can't hear. They made a golden calf. And Aaron the high priest was behind the whole thing. He led it all. And they made that calf and they worshipped that calf while Jehovah, or Yahweh, was on the mountain, Mount Sinai, giving the Ten Commandments for God's people. So as Moses came down, he just couldn't handle it. He just <clears throat> threw the tablets down and great judgment and warnings and so on happened there at Mount Sinai. So that was a great testing of the Lord's patience. Then they moved on after Mount Sinai to Hazaroth, and there it was Aaron and Miriam's rebellion against Moses. Miriam struck by leprosy. She was Moses' sister, but she's healed by the grace of God. And then from there on, they moved to a place called Kadesh Barnea. Not a place the Jewish people want to be reminded of. What happened there? Well, you remember from Sunday school? They sent the 12 spies into the promised land, Canaan. These, these people were on their, on their way to the promised land. I didn't mention that. A promised land. God promised them that land that they would inherit it and that he would give them that land and that they would conquer the people in that land. So, there they were, Kadesh Barnea. They sent the 12 spies out into the promised land to go and check out how strong the people were and how fertile the land was. And the 12 spies came back with some produce, major grapes and a few other things from the land. And it was very impressive and they reported that it was a very fertile land, but the people in that land were huge and strong. And 10 of the 12 spies reported, we will never be able to conquer them. Those big men. In fact, they said, <laughs> we were like grasshoppers to those people, to those men. And from the other side, indeed, we felt like grasshoppers as well in their sight. They were so strong and powerful. So these ten spies went and spread rumors among the people, probably about two million of them. And we can't enter the land. Whoa, whoa, we can't do it. And they all got afraid and they all worked each other up. And they didn't listen to God who had led them there. And God who promised them for ages, hundreds of years, that they would enter, they would enter that promised land. That, that was their land. And they didn't want to go to the promised land. Except for two spies. Who were they? You know the story. Who were they? Very well known figures in the Old Testament. It wasn't Moses. No, no. Moses counted among the... Joshua, son of Nun. And Caleb, the Kenizzite. Yes. They believed that they could conquer the land. And that with the Lord's help, they would conquer and that they would inherit the land. But the others didn't want to go in. And then God was so disappointed with the, with the Israelites that he swore an oath in his wrath that they would never enter his rest. That's the promised land, and he was speaking to that generation of Israelites. And all those Israelites, that generation, 20 years or uh, 19 and under, all died in the desert. Sorry, no, what am I saying? 
See, Andrew, Andrew got it, got it wrong. All those 20 years and older died in the desert. That whole generation, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And it's only the younger generation, eventually, that entered the promised land 40 years later. Now, we need to understand some concepts here. Thank you, Carol, before we go any further. Here in Hebrews, there's God's oath. Verses 11 and 18. So I declare on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Now to whom did God swear? That is verse 18. That they would not never enter his rest if not those who disobeyed. So God's oath and God's swearing. Now, let me tell you, when God speaks, we can be sure that he means what he says. In the beginning he spoke, and the whole creation came into being. And the surest word God has spoken since creation was also his final word, and it was the Lord Jesus Christ, or by the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, everything is being sustained right now by his powerful word. That is when God speaks. But when God takes an oath, when God swears in his anger, you know that that oath is irrevocable. Then God really means what he says. And it's important to know that God promised Canaan to the Jewish patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And God repeatedly said that he would make their descendants as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And that he would give them Canaan as their inheritance. We must know that. In other words, their descendants would inherit the land come what may. God said so. That was a settled matter in God's mind. And you'll remember that when God promised this to Abraham and he believed God, it was counted to him as righteousness. He was counted as righteous in God's sight. But now, much later in history, and being very patient with this generation of Israelites who left Egypt through the Red Sea, because of their continued unbelief, God promised in an oath that this generation of Israelites would not be the privileged ones to enter his rest. That was the land of Canaan. Now we've got to get these things clear. And not even Moses would enter the promised land. Only Joshua and Caleb would. Because they were the only ones who were confident that God would do as he said. Numbers 13 and 14. Now there's another oath in Hebrews. We will look at that when we get to that chapter. That is the oath that God made about his son through whom we would inherit eternal life. The ultimate rest. But today our focus is going to be on the oath God swore in his anger. But then there's another concept here. Rest. Again in verses 11 and 18. You need to, we need to grasp this. Uh, so I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And then again, to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not to those who disobeyed? So there's the issue of rest. Now the writer to the Hebrews applies Israel's history in a spiritual way to his hearers. And who were they again, those Jewish Christians who lived in Jerusalem? So let's see what the writer means by rest here in Hebrews. In other places it may mean different things, but here in Hebrews this is what it means. Remember, Egypt symbolizes for us and for those Jewish Christians, but it symbolized a place of bondage to sin. 
you would find that otherwise in other places in the New Testament. Egypt symbolizes a place of bondage to sin. The Passover, remember? They celebrated just before they left Egypt, before they crossed the Red Sea. What did they do? What did they do? You know the Bible. You know what they did. They took the blood of the lamb and they smeared it on the doorposts and lintels. And the angel of death passed over every Israelite home. But the, the Egyptians there, before the firstborn died, it was the blood of the lamb, you see, Jesus Christ. Salvation from judgment and sin. Then there's the Red Sea. Salvation. Baptism symbolized. You see? And then there's the desert. A place of preparation for service for some. And also a place of anticipation. But sadly, also a place of doubt for many. <coughs> like with Israel. Numbers 13 and 14. They said, we are not able with the ten spies and the rest of the Israelites. Others say with Joshua and Caleb, we are able to, with God's help, to go on and obey and serve him the way he wants me to. They were confident in their God. And they crossed the Jordan into the promised land, a place of usefulness and service and growth and maturity and blessing and great reward. And then there's Canaan. Crossing the Jordan into Canaan is not heaven here in Hebrews. It's heaven in other places. But not here in Hebrews. It's a place of faith and submission rest. A place of conquering, of serving the Lord, a place of obedience, a place of usefulness for God, discovering your gifts, using your gifts, experiencing God's blessings in your life, growing in faith and in victory over sin, and a place of persevering in the faith. So when we think about rest, we need to think about these things. Because hopefully, if you're a Christian, you're reading your Bible. And you can encounter these things. Now the first Sabbath rest. We come to rest. God's Sabbath rest. Where do we read about that? Exodus chapter 20. The Lord created everything in six days. And on the seventh day he rested. That's the first Sabbath rest. Presently the Sabbath rest symbolizes Salvation rest. And future, the future of the Sabbath rest is heaven. Then Israel's Canaan rest is a faith rest. And the future is usefulness to God. I hope I see some, some question marks here. <laughs> Israel's Canaan rest, the promised rest for Israel, was Canaan. But today, for the church, uh, that promised rest is a place of service and blessing, a faith rest here in the church, and it involves usefulness for God. Then there is still the concept of faith in Hebrews. How does the writer to the Hebrews view faith? Look there at verse 13. And it would be good if you could follow me in the word. Because this is where I'm basing all this stuff from. I'm not a fantastic speaker. I'm not a motivational speaker. I'm, I'm, I'm not a TV personality. I'm a pastor of a local church. And I take the Bible seriously. Look there at verse 14. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. Hypostasis means a confidence, a confidence in a person, meaning confidence in God's person, particularly here. Trust in God. 
confident, firm trust in God, and therefore there follows obedience and submission to his will. Like Joshua and Caleb's faith. Yes, we can conquer the land. The Lord is with us. He's promised in his word. He's promised over and over again that the land is ours. Yes, we can go. And with his strength, we will do it. Now Hebrews deals with exercising diligent faith, if you like. Sanctifying faith. A faith that seeks to know God better and better through his word and through personal experience. As God, deal, as God deals with me in my own life, so I learn to trust God more and more. And as I base my experiences on the word of God. Now you will understand. If you neglect Jesus Christ, the living word. If you are drifting away from the word, you are not drawing closer to God. And you are not getting to know him better and better. And therefore, you will also not trust him as you should either. In fact, you will start doubting him. You will make yourself guilty of unbelief. You will doubt God's person, his intentions, his abilities, especially when you are called to act in faith yourself. Remember that caution in Hebrews 2 verse 1. We must pay more careful attention, therefore, to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. Now the next step in this regression is, now here in Hebrews 3 verse 12, there's the warning. See to it, brother and sister, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. The imperative here in Hebrews 3 for you today and for me is to be confident, not in yourself, not in the limited power of money or possessions, though we need those things to live and so, but that is not where our confidence lies. Not in the abilities of people, not in the clever schemes and the philosophy that this world offers. As Christians, we can't trust those things. Never! Our trust is in the triune God. Listen again. Hebrews 3, verses 7 to 11. So as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. During the time of testing in the desert. Ah, no man, we've heard all of this before. Ah, not this boring stuff again. Can't wait to get home. No, 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 no. Where, during this time of testing, where your father's tested and tried me for 40 and for 40 years, saw what I did. That is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on earth in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. We don't want that. As God's people. We don't want that. And now we come to our application today. I want to focus on verses 12 to 15. See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We are all prone to that. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had at first. As has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion.
It was not the only, it wasn't the Israelites alone that needed to cross the Jordan River. It's something we need to do daily and continually. That is if you want to enter the Lord's rest. And that is understanding that rest is not salvation or heaven, but practical usefulness now and today. Let's think of the church. Hey, our church is facing a huge challenge right now. Remember the church building project? Well, there was great excitement about that. People got involved in that. We were building a new church building. And we felt, well, we were really, really doing something. But the moment it was finished, some sat back as if we've arrived and reached a pinnacle in our service for the Lord. Some didn't even get involved at all. We know that for different reasons. But for those of us who were involved in that, we sat back and it is done now. Then came COVID and lockdown. Its effect was deadly in the spiritual sense of the word. And we became very snug and comfortable in our own homes. I mean, who didn't? You just sit there, you switch on your TV, you choose what you want. Watching church from a distance, if we got to church. But if we did, we were watching church on the sidelines, doing our own thing, focused on ourselves and our own needs. But as you should know by now, that that has never ever been God's plan with His church. You know? Me, my preacher, and my Bible. And that's it. That's all I need. That's enough. I know I have it all, and I know it all. No. Let me tell you until the wheels come off and my life falls apart, then it's normally a different story. And the real problem is here, the challenge is this, that this is subtle. And that this habit has not really been broken for some of us. Or if the habit is broken, then the mindset is still there. You see, God's plan for you, my brother and sister, includes a real local church. With real people. In real flesh and blood who will enable you to do real ministry in real time and also be ministered to in real time and in the flesh and when we gather together I want to tell you something really happens isn't it and the idea is that God speaks to us collectively guides us all together in the same direction through his word. That word, it's the word for the church at a particular time. <clears throat> that enables us to start acting in unity as God's people. We don't hear a little message here and a little message there. And they might be good, but it might not be for our local church at that time. You see, God demands personal faithfulness from each one of us. And that most definitely involves the local church. Nothing more, nothing less. And by faithfulness we mean who possesses. Submitting to his control. Doing his will for us as a church together. Trusting him to do the rest. The challenge for us is this. Are we going to be content with complacency and doubt or are we going to move ahead in confidence? There remains for us the promise of rest, entering Canaan, the promised land, a time of blessing and suffering and usefulness for the Lord Jesus Christ. But God forbid if unbelief persists, that he will swear in his anger. They will never enter 
my rest. Saved, but left there as a monument of failure for God's people or for the world to see. Let me tell you, my brother and sister, if there are bitterness in your heart about something, God will want you to sort that out. Maybe there's somebody in the church, maybe it's even with me, that you are bitter with them. You're angry with them. That's the way God will bless our church. We need to forgive and be willing to confess if that is a problem for us. And if you need to come and trust in Christ, come. The Lord will do it. The Lord has given you a marvelous opportunity. He's offering his salvation for you. He's given himself for you. He's given you everything. He's given his life for you. And you must come and trust him. You see, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Don't. Because there will come a time <laughs> when it might not be so rosy and easy. And then if you need to step forward and, and be baptized, do it. If you know the Lord wants you to be baptized, go for it. If that is the Lord's will for you, do it. Does it depend on the pastors? Other people to ask you and say, if the Lord, if you know that that is the Lord's will for you, you must go through the waters of baptism, do it. That's the first step of obedience for any believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you have a gift, we all have it. God has given each one. If you're a Christian, you have gifts or gift, you take gift or gift, come and use it in the body of Christ, in real time for God's people. Not from a distance, oh yeah, they there, and pff, now and then I pop in and, you know, I catch up now and again and so on. Cool, you know? No, no, no. Get involved. If you live in Walters Bay and the Lord has shown you this local church, He wants you to be involved in this local church and to serve Him practically in this church. And you see, God has proven himself faithful over and over again. And over again. So come and trust him. And see where he wants you to serve him practically. In the church. You may be using, doing that at the moment, and that is good. But you may not be. Or if you're not serving him, or if you, even if you're serving him, it may be begrudgingly. And not with a believing heart. Then there's also your personal Jordan as a Christian. Is your confidence in God or in man or in earthly wealth and security? In the cool weekend that's lying ahead, you know, that's how we live. We work and we work. Oh, thank goodness it's Friday. Now I have a cool weekend. I live for that moment. Now, obviously, it's not wrong to do that, but we can't live for those things. Oh, you haven't lived if you haven't been here or haven't done that. No. No, 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 no. God. When you really and honestly look at your life today, what is your conclusion? I trust my job. I trust in money. I'm retired. Well, I've got lots of money. I'm okay. I trust in a person for my security. If that is the case, it will be difficult for you to really trust God. To have confidence in God for the future. And let me tell you, when the storms of life start raging, and when the church of Christ is attacked by powerful enemies, by Satan himself and his fierce demons, and it happens when, bat when the battle gets so intense that you literally feel the heat. Let me tell you, your life may crumble. Your faith may be destroyed. That is if your confidence is in the wrong place. 
So see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it's called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. But I want to be very positive as we close today. As I said, this is not the easiest message for any pastor to preach. I don't think the Jewish people want to read <laughs> those chapters in the Bible. They don't want to go back to their history and play this one here. I want to affirm that God is able. God is faithful. God is loving. And he is the king, hey? He's all powerful. He knows your situation. God promises if you belong to the Savior, that's Jesus Christ, he will protect you. He will lead you. He will give you abundant wisdom if you ask him. God will intervene for you. God will provide for you. We battle with that one, don't we? You know why? Because, exactly because our stakes are so high on money and material things when it comes to security. There's a promise, a wonderful promise here in Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 5 about money. What does it say? Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we can say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? I've heard some stories but people <laughs> who want to go to a church where they can get a lot of money and live easily. Young people here, the lady in tears. I don't want to carry on like this. I don't want to have a little job and just get so much money every month. I, I want to make progress and get a lot of money. You know, people, uh, uh, please pray for me, Pastor. Now, look, I understand, but that is not what the Christian life is all about. So, I remember a time in Carol, look, I'm not bragging, I'm just saying, a time when Carol and myself, <laughs> oh my goodness, in Manalong, <laughs> the church called us, we were there, and we found out that most of the people in that church, I don't think we're even Christians. And they left. The moment we started preaching the word, they left. And then it was Carol and myself. And they offered us a laughable little salary, which we couldn't live on. But when God provided, we stayed. We were sure that God wanted us to stay in that church. And how do people provide? How does God provide for these people? Well, we were in a farming community. And the young people came to that area and we received fruit and veggies and other stuff galore. I tell you, we've never seen uh, mangoes like that that we got, hey? Maybe mangoes and a few other things. And the Lord provided for us. We were even to go, uh, able to go on a holiday that year to slung the rocks of all places for a week because somebody offered it to us and paid for us. We arrived there with our old little golf at the hotel there and slung the rocks well. <laughs> the people looked at us like this. <laughs> these big Mercedes Benzes and these big wonderful cars just stopped in. So. You know, you have been running the little blue little golf. Nevertheless, you got that holiday. The Lord provided. In fact, with Carol and myself, we couldn't even have our own children. 
we were so weak and powerless. But God provided. I know some of you have different stories and different testimonies, but I'm just sharing this in terms of God providing. And he did. Children. Even if you come and visit us in our house, the furniture there, I think the two big chairs, black chairs we got there in the house we bought, but the other stuff was all given to us. We didn't work for that. We didn't buy the stuff. God gave. You see, God is able and God is faithful, all right? You, we, I, myself, must have confidence in Him. And I must remind myself of that all the time. We must learn to trust Him more and more as we travel along life's narrow road, that road of the Christian life. And if we don't, Something is desperately wrong some way. Do you know why God was angry with the Israelites in the desert? You stated it, but let's think about it again. Was it because they didn't keep the Ten Commandments? No. Was it because they didn't pray and didn't offer up sacrifices? Was it because they didn't give their tithes or so? No. It was this, despite seeing and experiencing God's faithfulness over and over and over again, God's miraculous deliverance at the Red Sea, God's provision in terms of food, the manna and the quail, water in the desert, material things, riches from Egypt, God's constant protection from their enemies, God's continual guidance, through the pillar of cloud by day and by the pillar of fire by night. They did not and would not trust God with the future. God had promised them over and over again that he would, that they would be able to conquer Canaan. Because he would be fighting for them. But then despite the proof of past faithfulness, they had no confidence in God. And they feared what man could do to them. Those big dudes in Canaan. Hey, this is what caused God to do. But he speaks about in Numbers 32. He swore an oath in his wrath. Oh, conclusion. I've got another illustration here. I see our time's up. Uh, Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 24. Please go there with me. Quickly, Luke chapter 8, it's in the Bible, Luke is in the Bible. Um, I know some people have the name Luke, but the Luke I'm talking about is in the Bible, Luke chapter 8 and verse, verses 22. One day Jesus said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake. Now, what was Jesus doing? There's the boat. Let's go over to the other side. What he was doing is indirectly, he says, well, come with me and we'll get to the other side of the lake. It was a promise, you see. Let's go over to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. And as they sailed, he fell asleep on purpose. Yeah. And a squall came down on the lake, and it must have been a terrible storm, so that the boat was being swamped and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him and said, Master, Master, we are going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters, the storm subsided and all was calm. And then he asks us, Where is your faith? He asked his disciples. Now obviously he is the Lord. And they weren't aware of that because they were fully, because they were absolutely amazed when he did calm the storm as God. But why did he ask that? Well, he said, let's go over to the other side. There was a promise. They would get to the other side from the Lord. You see, God has promised you many things in Jesus Christ, my brother and sister. And all those promises are yes and amen for you. For you who know Jesus personally. Now I can't mention them here today. But 
We, we all know this now, that God has promised and that he's faithful. God has promised to get us to the other side, my brother and sister. He says to Peter, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it or will not be able to stand against it. I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. We're not thinking of the church building here. We're not thinking so much of the gathering here every Sunday morning. We're thinking of God's people being the church. And you, although you are weak, and in fact unable, He will build His church through you. That's what He says. Do you believe that? That's the question. You say yes. Well, then the challenge is, go on and prove it. And obey Him. Take action. Serve Him. Not with reluctance. Not with fear. Not with doubt. But with confidence. Be bold for a change. Step out in faith. Put your foot in the Jordan River. Enter the promised land. Because He is with you. He will never leave you. He will never fail you, my brother and sister. That he not only says in his word, that he has proven over and over again in your life and in mine. So as the Holy Spirit says, see to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. But encourage one another daily, as long as it is called today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end the confidence we had for, at first. As just has been said, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Thank you so much for your patience.